Hello and welcome to the Digital Insight, the technology and supply chain podcast that delivers valuable C-level perspective into the core issues surrounding business transformation and digital disruption. Each episode will bring you the most inspiring executive insights from those leading transformation strategies within the world's biggest and best known companies. The Digital Insight, disrupt, transform, evolve. Welcome to the Digital Insight, the exclusive podcast series for Interface and CPO Strategy magazines. This week, we're speaking to a global leader in procurement and supply chain. Sam Achampong is head of SIPS MENA and re- responsible for leading supply chain and procurement transformations across the region. We'll be discussing how the Middle East and North Africa are keeping pace with the global revolution taking place within procurement and supply chain right now. Sam, welcome to the Digital Insight. Thank you very much. So could you start off by giving us a, a brief outline of your role at SIPS MENA? So, so my role, I, so I head up the, the SIPS Middle East, uh, North Africa and West Africa operation for, for SIPS. And I guess, as you know, the, the role of SIPS globally is to uh, promote and develop procurement and supply. So, so I carry out that role for uh, the stakeholders and the profession in that particular region. SIPS works in, in a number of ways. I guess if you look at if you look at a triangle, there's there's three main areas we work in. One is one is education, uh, and that's around our qualifications. Um, the other is around um, thought leadership in terms of the um, the events and uh, um, social network, networks we create, and the other is around um, our B2B operations where we work directly with organizations to work on uh, the capability development of, of their own procurement teams and their procurement organization. So, so that's primarily what I do for SIPs in the Middle East. Um, the operation in the Middle East has been around for probably about 10 years now. Um, and I think we, in terms of a region, I think we acknowledge that um, the level of maturity in procurement um is in many ways a little bit behind more established um areas of of the world in terms of the, the maturity of the profession uh, but over the the yeah. last 10 years that 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 gap has been closing so mm-hmm. we, we we've seen um we've seen some significant strides in terms of how people view procurement and um how strategic people see procurement however um, it, it, there, there does still remain a lag uh, in in recognising it as a strategic function, and, and we continue to work with organisations and individuals in this region to to, to improve that. I see. Um, what what kind of challenges um, would you say you're, you're facing at the moment? There, I mean, would that be kind of skill shortages or uh, technology uptake? So, so it's a bit of both. So there, there's there's skills shortages because there is um, a lack of people who have those commensurate um, professional and strategic skills in procurement um, in, in, in the region. So let, let's just, let's call them licensed procurement professionals um, mm-hmm. uh, as a title. So let, let's say people who are actually qualified in, in procurement practice um, and who have the skills in, in, that, in that function. So they're, that's a skills gap that any CPO uh, will acknowledge um, in, in the region. The other thing is the, the recognition of the profession itself. So when you go above the, the actual stakeholders around procurement, your CFOs, your CEOs, um, you know, the, the C-suite and, um, and others, the recognition of procurement as a, as a strategic function it, it is lacking. Um, as it is to a certain degree in other areas, but um, cer- certainly is lacking in many ways here. So what that means is it, you, you then find that a lot of procurement departments are uh, being used as um, transactional transactional departments who are um, either performing a compliance role or a simple transaction role. Um, so that obviously diminishes the role of procurement and diminishes the effectiveness of, mm-hmm. of what procurement can deliver. In, in this region, so, so that, that's that's the main problem. But I think the uh, you know I think I mentioned the the whole concept of a licensed procurement professional. There there, there is um, there, there really is a lack of depth 
in the market of people who have those skills when they are called upon. Uh, so as a result, you, you cannot look to a major organization and look to a particular a job description, um, you know, uh, procurement category manager, for example, in a in a major bank and assume that they have uh, the, the necessary skills that you that you would expect a you know, procurement IT category manager to have um, uh, because there just isn't that depth of skills in, in many areas. However, there's there, there are, um, as I said, there are big strides over uh, over the last, uh, you know, uh, five to eight years to improve that. So there are real centers of excellence around the region who who have been working uh, for a long time to overhaul their entire departments. And you're talking about, uh, you know, some of the major organizations like you know, Adnoc, the major oil company or Sabic in Saudi Arabia. Um, around to Etihad Airways in, in Abu Dhabi, who, who have been working very hard for a few years to ensure that procurement becomes a strategic function and the people who work in it are professionals. Could you see kind of more professional qualifications being introduced in the region? Yeah, so that, that's that's the other side of it. So there is the there is looking for people in the market who already have those skills. Um, that, that's one side of it. And the other side is putting together the infrastructure um, whereby people are able to to get hold of those skills, so that's that's one of the the, the backbones of what we're trying to do. And we've set up um, several study centres across the region where people can go and um, study SIPS qualifications um, anywhere around the region, from you know from Lebanon to Bahrain to, to Saudi Arabia to the United Arab Emirates to Egypt. So, so we've set up a network of study centres where individuals can go and get those skills. Um, and in addition to that, we've uh, worked very closely with a lot of organisations to set up in-house um, procurement academies, whereby we work directly with them to upskill their um, their teams um, to the highest level over a period of time. Um, so, so there, there's there's two areas in which we're working. One one is the mm -hmm. is the B two B, and the other is the, let's just call it the B two C, where you have the student network and uh, the individuals who want to attain those skills. Uh, another area is we're working with a lot of the educational establishments to work with them to um, ensure that procurement qualification skills and standards are available in the local university network. Um, so we, we've done that across the region where we, we work with um, um, centers of education um, to, to help them put, put in place um, uh, skills and qualifications that are commensurate with with leading practice procurement. Um, so that's another area. And I guess if you look on the other side of it, the other side is um, away from the people. It's a case of how people actually do procurement. So um, what, what are the strategic aims? What are the processes, practices? And we, we've also worked with several organizations to provide advisory services to look at how they actually do procurement and guide them um, into putting in place um, procurement practices that, that that are leading practices and are are going to um, help them achieve value. So um, we certainly worked with many organisations on that side of it, away from the the, the people side. And you'll look, you'll see um, organisations like the Dubai Expo 2020 project, who have recently um, gone through what we call the SIPS Procurement Excellence Program where we review how they do procurement and guide them towards um, uh, guide them towards best practice. Have you sort of encountered kind of uh, stark contrasts between, broadly speaking, the Middle East and the North Africa region? The, the, there, are, there are different pockets, of course. So the, the Gulf is a particular region. Um, the Gulf, you will find there are real centres of excellence and some real heavyweights who uh, are in the public and private sector who um, have invested in putting together um, skilled um, procurement professionals and invested in, in how their departments um, manage procurement strategically. So you will find some very educated, some very strategic people. Um, so, so that's on the, that's on the um, kind of corporate side. And when you look at uh, not more to North Africa, so a very populous country like Egypt, um, that's a very academic country. So you do find a lot of people who who, from the academic perspective, have gone through 
um, a level of education to attain uh, procurement skills. Um, may, maybe not to the highest level um, in terms of strength and depth, but, but that's the angle that, um, that happens in North America. It's more on a personal basis rather than with companies sponsoring um, people to go through qualifications. Uh, and, and West Africa, um, again, is slightly different. You have um, countries in West Africa like, like Ghana, who are working very hard now to um, establish procurement centers of excellence among the, the, the public sector. Uh, so again, we're working very hard with them to, to put in place um, structures that, that defend um, how they can um, build up the reputation of good public procurement within, within those kind of areas. So, so there are differences between you know, the, the, the Gulf, uh, North Africa and West Africa. Um, there are some subtleties between the public and the private sector. Um, but interestingly, I think uh, what's happened over the years is that there's, there's always been a gulf in the maturity levels of um, the, the, the practice of procurement and, and many other professions, by the way. Um, and what's happened over the, the last you know, two or three or three or four years is that the advent of technology has wrapped up. So there's an element now where people are looking to leapfrog at the long route of um, getting people um, highly qualified and educated in procurement and are instead trying to invest in technology to do that procurement um, for them, um, which, which makes sense to a certain perspective. But um, obviously the caution is always there to make sure that, um, you know, who, whoever is working on procurement for you in terms of people are your highly skilled commercial managers, because you, you know it's clear that you cannot rely fully on technology. Uh, and I, I can recall uh, one particular instance where the prerogative was to um, to try and eradicate as much as possible um, uh, ethics and procurement fraud from from the the procurement life cycle. So the the solution that was being implemented was um, a whole scale e-sourcing suite, um, which, which is a good idea in terms of transparency. But of course, um, the, the fact is that probably 80 percent of procurement fraud is carried out at the specification stage. So uh, you still need, you still do need to work on the people. Uh, otherwise, you're not really eradicating the problem. So, um, so technology as an enabler is a good thing, but um, it, it's never a a fully encompassing solution to um, totally ignore the people as well. Yeah, I mean, you, you touched upon ethics. I mean, obviously, transparency in the supply chain is a, a hot topic sort of globally. But I, I guess in within that region, building trust is is a very important part of this, you know, thinking about, you know, kind of foreign investment and stuff like that. I, I think you're right. And, um, you know, for, for, any, for any country or region that's looking to attract inward investment, it's incumbent on them to create uh, an environment that is conducive to um, that investment coming in. And, and key to that is procurement, you know, the, the reputation of, of how business is done um, and how um, supplies interact and how organizations are going through those transactions across the supply chain uh, to obtain value is absolutely crucial to um, to, to attracting investment. So, so, so ethics is key. We, we do work with a number of organizations and across the region uh, specifically on, on that subject. Um, in fact, there are several organizations who, who are now have um, the SIPS ethics kite mark where all of their team have specifically on that subject um, been, been trained in ethics and um, on the specific subject of ethics and the organization can um, demonstrate that uh, people within their team, as long as they procure anything, have a full knowledge of what the subject is. So, so that those, are the, those are a lot of the areas that, um, that we're working on very clearly to, to actually address that particular topic um, because people do see it as being very, very important. Mm. I mean, I guess some of that is is not only at private level, but obviously at national level as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, when you're talking about inward investment, it's um, it's always going to be you're always going to um, have to rely on the fact that the, the, the government is the biggest procurer, um, and uh, and actually that's a trend globally that uh, there is more public procurement 
um, going on um, that, than there ever was. So the, the government is going to be the biggest procurer, and that's where you need um, the, the reputation to be. Now, if you look at some statistics and um, in terms of the effect on, on, on procurement, I think there's something like um, procurement fraud at something like 20% to the cost of doing business um, in developing countries and, and 10% uh, to the cost of doing procurement anywhere else. So, so, so I guess for those areas and those countries who can ill afford um, and who have the, the least budgets, um, that becomes a really, really important topic to, to address because it, it directly affects their affordability to, to invest in infrastructure and other areas. You, you know, it's, it's adding to the cost of doing business across the world. So, you know, reducing that number by a small percentage um, does does make the spending power of organisations go further. So it, it, it's certainly, if not the, one of the key subjects and one of the key areas that um, procurement in this day and age does address and should address. I mean, obviously, another big business buzzword right now is um, sustainability as well. How, how is uh, MENA sort of keeping pace with that with the rest of the world? So, yes, yeah, sustainability from a kind of holistic perspective is... You know, a subject being adopted here like anywhere else in the world. Uh, again, we do need to take into account the maturity gap of the of the whole sustainability word itself. So, in other parts of the world, the the whole sustainability or corporate social responsibility started off with being just a green topic, um, and has since migrated to being more holistic. Uh, you know, people, planet, uh, profit, and everything along those lines, and. So now more and more here, you are looking at people looking at uh, recycling being part of the whole total cost of ownership answer. You do have a lot of sustainability initiatives being built up um, around countries. So, so it's certainly being built into how people procure. There's a little way to go, of course, but um, but it certainly is acknowledged as a as a socially responsible way of procuring. And I think in a lot of the things we do and work with with people, we we, we continue to impress upon people that it, it's not it's not as if at this um, at, at this stage sustainability is just a buzzword. It is a real total cost cost of ownership concept, and you know sustainable procurement does does have a lower total cost of ownership tag to it, um, and a lot of organisations are, are coming to that realisation as we go through. I guess also local sourcing is uh, rising up the list of priorities for procurement officers. I'm kind of thinking of initiatives such as the Made in Saudi Arabia program. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, yes, there's there's a lot of, if you, if you just talk about the Gulf, there, there's, there's a lot of requirement to import a lot of things. Um, but the focus, such as the Made in Saudi Arabia program and, and similar um, local content, local sourcing initiatives, in you know in the UAE and Bahrain are based on saying there are um, commodities that are available here and therefore if we don't need to source externally then then we should really um, source locally so so that is starting to happen uh, and if you look at the the Saudi um, 2030 vision there is a big emphasis on um, local sourcing local content all the way down to um, local capability development of local people. So that that is a theme uh, for all the all the um, governments in the Gulf who are looking to diversify the economies. Um, they're looking to diversify um, inwards to say, let's take advantage of the things um, that we have here, including the human capital, and let's maximise that. Uh, and, and that's consistent across um, across the Gulf, without a doubt. And I guess also localization would kind of require kind of a restructuring of of supply chain and distribution. Yes, uh, I mean, I think you know, supply chain. If you look at the whole procurement cycle, which of course includes logistics and supply chain, if you look at a holistic procurement cycle, um, so that tail end, the supply chain has been. In, in maturity terms, the one thing that has probably been left behind to any kind of um, strategic strategic extent. But a lot of focus is now being put on it in places like, for example, in Oman, um, supply chain and logistics is becoming 
a big thing. Oman are really, uh, are really focusing on becoming a hub. So it's, it's the supply chain logistics are, are coming to the fore. And assembling those supply chains and, and how they operate uh, is getting more and more sophisticated from what we can see uh, around the transshipment port, ports that, um, that are available around those, those key areas. So if we look at um, the, the SIPS risk index, which, which um, we run to show what um, the relative movements in supply chain are, I think it's clear that in in the Middle East region, um, su supply chain routes are difficult um, and they're not getting any easier. However, um, there are more in innovative uh, ways in which people are getting things around and assembling supply chains that make sense. Are there any sort of examples of that that you can think of? Um, I think um, look, if, if you look at um, the, the restructuring of the supply chain um, between um, in Oman, for example, they, they developed a, a, a whole new um, uh, town out of nothing, really. A place called Dukum in, in Oman has been set up to uh, to deal with the total restructuring of the supply chain in the region, where um, there's there's been disruptions in supply chains between places like Iran um, and that uh, area in, um, in Oman has taken on that slack and, and managed to reroute um, the supply chain around the region to make sure things continue to happen. So that's 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 a that's a key point, um, a, a key example of of how um, I guess agile it, it can be. And if you look at the example of Dukum, it's um, you know to give an example from maybe um, a year and a bit ago, it was a small town with uh, probably one flight a week there, and now it's a it's a it's an established town with um, a proper town centre and, uh, and and daily flights there. So that's how agile some of these um, logistics centres have become to um, to react to changes in the supply chain, which which I guess happen probably more regularly um, out here than the, than in other places, perhaps. Kind of driving a lot of uh, the procurement transformation at the moment is technology. Obviously, uh, MENA has had sort of issues with uptake of technology in the past, and I'm kind of thinking uh, in terms of cashless banking and they've had cyber security weaknesses and what have you. But what, what kind of challenges have you seen there with regards to the technological side of it? People have access to, you know, the, the latest technology and people do have access, are able to, to purchase um, the, 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 the best solution that, that they can afford. So if there is an issue that it's sometimes a case of people over specifying um, what, what they want. So, an organization may have um, acquired the latest ERP or e-sourcing suite um, or solution, and that is applicable to their operations. And uh, to a certain extent, other organizations have seen that and said, okay, we'll, we'll have that as well without aligning it directly to, to what they need. So there has been, to a certain extent, some over-specification, which procurement transformations now are addressing that. Um, there, there's an awful lot of procurement transformations going along where organizations are actually really looking at what they've done over the last 18 months and and right sizing or repointing how technology is adding value so you have uh, people looking at um, developing um, marketplaces uh, where they haven't thought about that before a lot of organizations are creating their own marketplaces where um, everyone can be a buyer um, rather than um, continue to centralize procurement across a procurement team. So they are making use of those um, cloud-based systems and those um, marketplaces and those call-off contracts that, that are enabled by, by some of the technological solutions out there. So, and in terms of transformation, I think there are a myriad of organizations of different sizes who are um, going through transformations at, at the minute related to procurement. Sometimes it's it's uh, whole scale, uh, re-looking really at the capabilities. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's looking at the capabilities and the structure and the systems um, and the processes at the same time. Um, so so I guess you've probably got an 18 month to three year cycle in which um, for, for those organizations, they will have embedded practices um, and they'll start to see the value from that. But But I think... If you look at technology anyway, globally, um, it's 
uh, certainly in a survey that we we ran recently it's 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 not yet proven on a whole scale that uh, digital transformation if we go straight to digital transformation that digital transformation has yet seen all of the benefits that it should have so uh, again that, that that's a maturity thing um you know these transformations and these initiatives need to be embedded uh and, and that's what's going to happen over the next uh, 18 months to three years here for those organizations who are, who are going through um large-scale transformations and and as i've said before that there, there are so many organizations who who are transforming um how they do procurement right now do you see um, blockchain playing a, a bigger part in uh, procurement transformation? Blockchain is an interesting one because it's uh, you know it's a uh, it's, it's an emerging technology, but uh, and it's also a buzzword. And you know certainly wherever I go, people are asking me for uh, more information on uh, blockchain and procurement supply, uh, how it can be adopted. Uh, you get um, certain solution providers who have been asked um, by uh, their clients. When can we implement blockchain? We have, uh, you know, the UAE government, for example, who have um, said that they will become the first blockchain government by by 2020. So there's a lot of lot going on around blockchain, and there are several um, practical examples of how blockchain are used in Jebel Ali Port. Um, uh, blockchain is used uh, certainly around scanning, uh, transshipments, and etc. And there are many other examples um, around the world and around the region. I think that the reality is that um, blockchain is not yet an end-to-end -end solution. And I think when it is, then you'll see the benefits of the, the, the really embedded end-to-end uh, -end blockchain solutions where people either have um, an in-house blockchain or a localized blockchain across um, groups of businesses, uh, a corporate blockchain almost. But at, at this, uh, right now, there are, there are different pockets of, of blockchain technology being used. Uh, and, and what we're lacking at the moment is, is an end-to-end -end solution. Um, but I guess the, the difference here is that once end-to-end -end solutions start being uh, implemented practically, uh, I think that's where regions like the Middle East will come into the fore because they, they are perfectly positioned uh, to then be leaders in the adoption of this technology um, because they don't have um, a lot of legacy systems and practices to hinder their adoption of, of new technologies. And they also have very strong ad advocacy in, at the government level. And, and the government level is very, very important. Um, if the UAE government, for example, says that they will become the um, first block blockchain government by 2020, well, that means that, um, you know, everyone's going to have to participate in that transformation um, because if the government are making a priority, then certainly everyone else does, has to. So, there's a great opportunity um, for um, wide-scale adoption of blockchain technology um, when end-to-end -end solutions are implemented. And you know, companies out here are very, very open to um, te technological changes. Certainly, so we could actually see an acceleration within that region. No, absolutely. And uh, you, you know, four days ago, it was the second annual um, blockchain summit held in Dubai. Um, probably about 6,000 people there and all the main players there from um, Facebook, Google, IBM, et cetera. Um, it, it's, it's, the, it's the second year of a, of a huge gathering uh, on blockchain uh, and participants include, you know, key figures in, in, in the UAE government, the, you know, the, the, the Minister for Artificial Intelligence, et cetera. So there, there is real backing uh, for the implementation of, of this particular technology. So it's going to happen, and and when it does happen, um, the, the the region is perfectly perfectly poised to be a leader in the adoption of blockchain technology um, end to end. You kind of answered all my questions there. Was there was there anything else that you'd like to put forward? Or um, I think uh, yeah, I think I think that's really it. I think we've covered uh, most of the areas in terms of um, capability development technology uh, and ethics. So no, from my perspective, I think we covered everything. Well, it's fascinating. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening to the Digital Insight Podcast in association with TheInterface.net and CPOStrategy.com. 
The Digital Insight is brought to you by B2E Media Limited. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review. And don't forget to check out our podcast archive at www.b2e-media.com slash podcast.